Putnam is eventually going to be giving his own positive theory about how he thinks things are. But a lot of it is a negative argument against a particular view. So the very first thing that we should do is we should try to get that view really into clear focus. And here in a very broad way is how we're going to understand the view that Putnam is attacking. And I'll call it the claim psychologism. And psychologism says that knowing the meaning of a term is just to be in a certain psychological state. This of course is the first of the, the two unchallenged assumptions he talks about at the beginning of the paper. We'll talk about the second unchallenged assumption later. We're going to focus on this first one. Now initially that might strike you as a truism. How could you be denying that knowing the meaning of a term is just to be in a certain kind of psychological state? But the reason why Putnam is attacking this is because he has a very particular kind of psychological state in mind. Really the psychological state he has in mind is something like knowing the connotation of a word. What we have been calling connotation he refers to as intention. So when you're reading this paper, you should be aware that intention, this word, basically means the same thing as what we've been calling connotation. So in particular, he's going to be arguing that knowing the meaning of a word, well, it's not the psychological state of knowing its connotation or knowing its intention. But again, you might ask, well, what, what's involved in saying that the meaning of knowing the meaning of a word is knowing the connotation or the intention? Well, Putnam distinguishes two different versions of this view. We might call one the strong view and one the weak view. So on the strong view, the connotation is basically a list of necessary and sufficient conditions. That is, it's a list of things that all and only things satisfying that term have. So for instance, the connotation of water on this view would be a list of necessary and sufficient conditions that only water has. So maybe it's something like clear, drinkable liquid, odorless, needed to quench thirst in humans, something like that. The reason why this is a very strong view is because when you think about it, it's actually pretty implausible that for anything we know the meaning of, we know necessary and sufficient conditions which determine it. So even the example of water I gave is a bit tenuous. Like, do we really know necessar the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be water beyond just being water? Probably not, but, and it's easier to come up with more complicated examples. So like, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be golden? I mean, you can think of maybe like yellow and metallic, but that doesn't, you know, lots of other things beyond besides gold or yellow and metallic. So this strong view, maybe it's a view people actually had, but Putnam wants to make clear this isn't the only one he's going to be attacking because it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a more implausible version of the idea that to know the meaning you have to know, or the state of knowing the meaning is to be is to know the connotation. On the weaker view, a connotation is maybe something like a rough and ready method for figuring out whether something applies, whether a term applies to something. So that's the strong view, the weak view. Connotation is not infallible method for figuring out what the term applies to. So arguably, this weak view makes more sense of the examples I just gave you a second ago. So I said, like, on this view, part of the connotation of water might be things like clear liquid, drinkable, odorless, properties like that. Maybe they don't uniquely pick out water, but if you want to figure out, at least on Earth, what things are water, that's a pretty good method for finding out whether something is water or not. So in the weak view, the connotation would consist of properties like that. Properties which don't necessarily, uh, don't, they're, not, they're not quite necessary and sufficient conditions, but they're a pretty good list to keep in mind when you want to figure out whether the term water applies to something or not. So this is the view that Putnam's going to be attacking. Really both forms of this view, the strong and the weak one. The strong view being the view that knowing the meaning of a term is 
knowing necessary and sufficient conditions for its application, a weak version of the view being that knowing the meaning of a term like water is knowing some sort of not infallible method for figuring out what it applies to. That's all that goes into knowing the meaning of a term or not. As I said, there is this second thesis he says about the, he mentions at the beginning about, about meaning. That's one thing we'll talk about uh, in one of the later videos. I want to say one more important thing about this view before we go on and before we see the argument against it. Because again, you might still be thinking, okay, that helps me understand a bit the view that Putnam is attacking, but how could sort of anybody disagree with this view still? And more broadly, what's going on is that this view presents what we might call an internalist picture of meaning, or an internalist picture of knowing the meaning of something. And Putnam is going to be arguing against this internalist picture in favour of what we call an externalist picture of meaning. Now these are kind of hard to state precisely, so I'm just going to give you a very broad brushstrokes picture about, you know, what the difference between these two things is. So let's take an example. Suppose we have a term like water. And as a matter of fact, you know, that picks out the substance H2O in the world. We can sort of think about an in internalist picture of the meaning and knowledge of the meaning of a word like water, like this. So what, we, what happens is we have people and they have in their heads a list of properties. You know, they have in their heads an intention or a connotation, so like properties like drinkable, clear, liquid, and so on. The term gets associated with that list, and the list sort of picks out water. Now the picking out may be more or less fixed. If you have the strong view, then this is necessary and sufficient conditions. So really, in a very strong sense, picks out H2O. H2O is exactly the one thing that has all of those things. On the weak view, this picking out relation is a little bit is a little bit weaker. You know, maybe it's not only picked out by water, but it's a pretty good way to find out what water is. Now on this picture, what's going on is that water is associated with this connotation, and this connotation basically determines what the word stands for. So this relation of the, between water and H2O can sort of be broken down into two steps. The relationship between water and the connotation, and the relationship between the connotation and the world, what the, what the thing picks out in the world. This is kind of a familiar picture. This is a little bit like, as, as Putnam says, it's, a lot, it's kind of like the sense reference picture from Frege. It's very much the kind of thing that Mill had in mind when he was talking about the meaning of natural kind terms. So this is a very kind of re well-reputed view. It's a very, you know, a very popular view at the time that Putnam was writing. So this is the internalist view. And again, this is the kind of view that Putnam is attacking. How does the externalist view go? It's kind of hard to draw the picture exactly at this stage, but on this view, it's not sufficient that water be associated with an intention or connotation. That's not sufficient for it to pick out, you know, the substance H2O. On the externalist picture, in some sense, it's the fact that it's H2O around you in the first place that helps you mean that helps you mean that. That's going to be a little become a little bit clearer later on. But the way to think about the internalist and the externalist pictures, how they differ, is on the internalist picture, you know, everything that you need to pick out H2O, that is something that's going on in your head. All the facts that determine that that's what it talks about or what goes on in your head. On the externalist picture, what's going on in your head is not sufficient for water to pick out H2O. So we have water, again, maybe it's still associated with this connotation, but also the idea is that together with facts about the world then determine that it picks out H2O. And the crucial difference between the externalist and the internalist picture is that on the externalist picture, what's going on in your head is not by itself sufficient to pick out H2O. It's only with help from the external world 
that you're able to think about that your that your term or that you're thinking about H2O when you know the meaning of it. To help you see a little bit more at this stage what, what that might involve, there are important similarities between the kind of view that Putnam is going to be giving about natural kind terms and the view Kripke gave last week. Because Kripke's view was another one of these views where the meaning of the term is not totally determined by just, you know, what's going on in the, in the language user's head at that particular time. So remember on his causal theory of, of names, once you get far, far enough down the causal chain, what determines that you're talking about somebody at the start of the chain is not like the descriptions that you may or may not have going on in your head. It's the fact that you're in this causal relationship to them. It's this fact about the external world that makes your term, your, your name for them, be a name for that person. And something kind of similar is going to go on with Putnam. He's going to be saying, in a similar way, the kind of descriptions you associate with water are not going to buy, are not going to be the things that by themselves suffice to be picking out H2O. You actually get substantial help from the world, just as, the, just as you do on the causal theory of names. You get substantial help in, from the world when you know the meaning of a term. That's why Putnam is thinking knowing the meaning of a term is not purely a psychological state. The world partly steps in as well to help to help determine what the, what the word means in the first place. So here's how we're going to understand the psychologism view going forward. The claim, as we're going to understand it, says that knowing the meaning of a term is just to have some criterion for determining whether or not an object falls under that term. So knowing the meaning of the word water is just having some criterion for determining whether or not the term water applies to something. This is the kind of internalist view that Putnam is going to attack with these twin earth examples.